Well, if you recall, on Monday I talked about Paul's, um, really his objective or his goal and purpose in ministry that he said he, he wanted to present everyone perfect and we might put that as complete and settled and resolved in their relationship with Christ, that they might know what their true real identity is as a follower of Jesus and not be led astray by some other false concept. In fact, this is something that Paul will be speaking of, we'll see later on in the chapter. In fact, just as a little side note here, we find that in every single letter of the New Testament, except for the little letter of Philemon, and I think this even includes Acts and the Gospels as well, we find that there's always references to false doctrine, false teachings, heresies, that from the very beginning, Satan has been trying to twist and tweak and pervert the Word of God and to get help or cause people to have a false or misguided understanding of what the scriptures teach and what it means to be a born again follower of Jesus Christ. Uh, the point is that if we get confused about our true identity, then we get confused about what our real purpose is, and we end up doing things that uh, are non-productive, and sometimes that can even be extremely hurtful and deceptive. But as we continue on to the text, uh, Paul again said, my, my goal is to present everyone perfect in Christ. Now he says, my purpose. So the goal is basically your end result, what you want to see at the end of what you do. But the purpose means the really the activity or the behavioral objectives that you're going to engage in. Uh, how do I measure whether or not I'm moving towards my goal or not? They're kind of like the, the road signs or the benchmarks that tell us what kind of pro progress we're making in our Christian life. And uh, Paul basically said, my purpose is that they may be encouraged in heart. And being encouraged in your heart is a really a critical important dynamic. Now, I, I emphasize that because I know that all of us can easily get discouraged. In other words, uh, what Satan knows is that the most ineffective Christian is the one who is the defeated Christian. Because when we feel defeated, we start becoming depressed, we become morose. Uh, we kind of sometimes, it's like, I'm like a drowning man. I, I took life-saving when I was in high school and they taught us how to rescue somebody who was drowning. And it was interesting, they said the worst thing you can do is swim right up to him or her face to face because they'll throw their arms around you and they'll drown you with them. And so they taught us how to kind of dive underneath them, swim around, come behind them, and then take control of them and lead them to safety. And I find oftentimes there are some Christians who are so overwhelmed by life and they're drowning that that's all that comes out of them is negative reinforcement. And they can drown other Christians. They can draw other people down into that kind of same pit of despond and despair that they're in. I know there's a balance. I know that we need to have people that we can talk honestly and truthfully with. But at the end of the day, it's really important that we not give people the impression that we're giving up on our faith because we're going through a hard time. In fact, I would add that I'm not sure I can mention or remember many times that weren't hard. But the fact is you believe and trust that you are more than conquerors in Christ. That's it was really Paul's final statement at the end of chapter 8 in writing to the Romans, where he talks about the difficulty and the challenges and the failures and the moral struggles and all the rest of it. But he said, you know, we are more than conquerors in Christ. And so Paul's life, we look back on and saying, yeah, this guy went through more stuff. He's like, if he isn't at the same level of Job, I don't know what is. But the point is, he overcame. And he overcame by the blood of the Lamb. And he never lost sight of the prize of the high calling. So Paul said, you know, I'm writing to you because I know, essentially, I'm kind of putting it, adding my commentary here, but he, Paul is essentially saying, inferring, I take from what he says later on, that I know that you're going to face some really challenging things, some really difficult things for you to uh, stand up against, and they may knock you over and defeat you. And so he started off the, the letter by saying, let's understand who Jesus is, that he is Lord, Lord of all things, and there's nothing in your life that he doesn't Lord over, that there's nothing to touch your life that he hasn't allowed to touch your life, that has to pass through him first. And so saying all of that, let's really focus on all the things that God is and what he can do and how Jesus is the answer to every question that you have and every problem you'll ever face. And he says, so that what I want to do, my purpose is to encourage your heart and then he begins to list some very specific things where we need encouragement. First of all, he said, number one, that you be united in love. And we read through that really quickly and then move on to the next thing without really taking time to think about how united or divided is my love towards people in my life. 
And this is really kind of a hard one for us to parse sometimes because you see, there are people who do not love us and, and treat us in an unloving way. Some of them are just intent, unintentional, uh, have a casualness, a casual disregard, if you will. But there are other people who are dead set about doing the worst that they can to you. And, you know, it's really hard to say, I love that person. And yet, let me kind of separate that out, that just because somebody is doing something that's wrong, it's never healthy for you and I to enter into a place of hatefulness. Uh, it's never healthy for us to be thinking about how we're going to even the score. We're going to, you know, to believe me, malicious is the word, where we want to do malice to that person and, and see them suffer. But in rather, we want to see them come into a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. Let me give you a personal example that I think everybody can relate to. Is that as I look at the current regime that's running our country into the ground, um, I really, really believe that it, we're being led by some deeply wicked people. Now, you've heard my explanation about being ungodly. And ungodly leads to evil behavior, and evil behavior becomes habitual. Then it's wickedness. And I believe that these are people who have evil behavior as a lifestyle and a habit. It's not just something they fall into. This is what their purpose. They're calling evil good, and they're calling good things evil. And uh, I pray for those people every day. And I know that God loves them, and I know, therefore, that I need to have that love in my heart. And you can really tell whether you're loving somebody when you pray for them, if you're really praying and yearning that God would lead them to repentance and save their souls, because they're going to experience an eternal judgment that is so much more horrific than anything we can imagine, that if we really did understand the horror of that, we would be praying earnestly that God would turn them around and save them. And I think that's the key. When we look at men like Nebuchadnezzar coming to Christ, we look at people like Paul coming to Christ. Uh, these are not good people. These are bad people who are doing really, really bad things. And yet hell is going to be a terrifying reality for them if they don't come to a true faith in the God of the Bible. And so we need to have that, that perspective that I hate the evil that they do, but I pray for their souls. I have no illusions about it being what they're doing is being good because what they're doing is just pure evil. It's wicked in the most evil and wicked sense. And yet at the same time, they by, Paul tells me that they have been taken captive by Satan to do Satan's will. So their behavior's response are a, a reaction to really spiritual deception. Uh, they've in many ways sold their soul to the devil in kind of what we call a Faustian bargain, if you ever saw the play Faustus. But the whole point is that they have made an, a deal in their heart because they think this is the way to find fulfillment, wealth, power, prosperity, and so forth, control over their environment. And, and they think that's going to lead to happiness. And what the Bible says is in this world they may be in charge, but in hell they'll be at the bottom of the pit and they'll be writhing in agony and terror. And so that what, what makes us really kind of hateful to those people is because in some ways we want to have the power. We want to have the wealth. As, as the psalmist said, Asaph said in Psalm 80, 73, he says, I was envious of the wicked because it seems like they live charmed lives. Essentially, he was saying, nothing, they have no problems. Read through Psalm 73. It's very, very interesting, very a godly perspective given to somebody who's struggling against the evil that he sees all around him and those who seem to be prospering through it. And yet he says, I, I felt this way until I considered their end. He says, I went into the house of the Lord and I considered their end, where they're going to end up. And that's why when he talks about being united in our love, that we need to be united in our love for these people, even though they are doing bad and evil things. So that what we say is not out of hatred or disgust or despising them, but rather because not only are they doing great harm and great damage to individuals, and in our case, and to entire nation and much of the world by their evil influences, but also because one day they will suffer. So... You know, we could talk about the Fauci's and the Biden's and the Soros and other people like that who seem to have a pretty diabolical agenda. I don't know that they know it, but they are deceived. They've been taken captive. They're doing the devil's will. And one day, if they don't come to Christ, they're going to suffer incalculably. And so you and I should 
not only pray that the house of the wicked would collapse and that he would expose the hidden works of darkness, but in doing so, just as he did with the apostle Paul, literally Paul saw his life collapse around him in a moment and he saw his evil deeds exposed for what they were, but what was the result? He came to repentance. So I'm praying for a Damascus Road moment for Joe Biden and his family and Hunter and all the rest of them, Jill. I'm praying for a Damascus Road event for George Soros and for Bill Gates and uh, President, former President Barack Obama and even, even President Trump, uh, dare I say it, because I'm not sure how, if he is a Christian, I don't know how mature he is, but it's really, really important that these, every one of us be sure of our salvation because we've come to an absolute surrender. And we'll know that whether that's happened by whether or not our lives are united, our hearts are united in love for these people and not be filled with vitriol and hatred. Uh, we, we just got started on the purpose. Well, we'll continue tomorrow talking about this. Many blessings in Jesus' name.